I think it's just naive not to be open-minded to something really, really bad happening. So I'm sitting here staring in the face at the biggest asset, and probably the broadest asset bubble, forget that I've ever seen, that I've ever studied. Um, but you know, 10 miles out is a 200-foot tsunami. In a recent one-hour-long interview, legendary investor Stanley Druckenmiller warned that the global economy is headed for trouble as the Fed might be unable to achieve a so-called soft lending. Druckenmiller seems to be very bearish on the global economy and the US economy in particular. And he believes that a major downturn may be coming as soon as this year. He cited a number of factors for his concern, including the development of inflation, the monetary policy over the last decade with record low inflation rate and the abrupt change that started in 2022 geopolitical tensions and the regional banking crisis. And on top of that, we've got very high commercial real estate vacancy rates. And Druckmiller is not the only one sounding the alarm. Other prominent investors such as Ray Dalio and Jeremy Grantham have also expressed concerns about the state of the global economy. So in this video, we will take a closer look at Druckmiller's warning, what a hard landing could look like, when Druckmiller anticipates a hard landing and how investors best position themselves. All right, so Stanley Druckmiller is a hedge fund manager that is particularly known for his macro investing approach. And it involves analyzing global economic trends. And yeah, he uses that analysis to make his strategic investments across a variety of different asset classes. This approach, for example, allowed him to correctly predict the dot-com bubble as well as the financial crisis of 2008. Now, in a recent interview at the Sun Investment Conference, Stanley Druckenmiller said that he believes the current economic conditions may be the most dangerous he's seen in his lifetime. He spoke to the global investment strategist and thought leader Kenil Sokolov. And in this video, I'll try to summarize the key takeaways from this one hour long conversation. So let's start with what Druckenmiller describes as the biggest asset bubble that he has ever seen in his lifetime. Let me just show you a short clip. Um, as you know, I've been saying for years that my observation was the worst uh, economic outcomes tended to follow asset bubbles. This has been going on for over 500 years. And basically every time you've had interest rates below 2%, going back 500 years, it's generally been followed um, with, with difficult economic times. So what he just said here is that the worst economic outcomes tended to follow asset bubbles. And oh boy, did we have an asset bubble in the last few years that was caused by the loose monetary policies by the Fed, the European Central Bank and other central banks following the great financial crisis of 08. The so-called everything bubble peaked during the pandemic. And what I would like to do now is to provide some more concrete data points about this almost legendary asset bubble. In 2022, a record 248 special purpose acquisition companies, so-called SPACs, raised 83 billion in new capital at the initial public offering, followed by another record year in 2021 with 613 SPACs raising 162 billion US dollars in capital. But ever since, SPACs have been a notoriously poorly performing asset group, wiping out multiple billions of dollars of investor wealth. In 2021, Bitcoin reached a peak of 64,000 US dollars and ever since hovered around 16 to 26,000 dollars per Bitcoin. So-called meme coins like Dogecoin went totally nuts during the everything bubble. There were multi-billion dollar frauds and the crypto crash has highlighted that without sound regulation, so-called stable coins are stable in name only. Listing all the hilarious stories related to the crypto bubble in particular is most certainly beyond this video, so I'll stop here. Finally, Prices for many tech stocks were so high during the everything bubble that literally hundreds of these stocks are down 70, 80 or 90% from their previous peak. And some so-called meme stocks most certainly still trade above their true intrinsic value. And Druckenmiller then expressed that he was astonished that the Fed and Jerome Powell in particular were letting this happen without actually intervening. And they were still buying hundreds of billions of dollars worth of bonds every single month during the peak of the bubble. According to Druckenmiller, they way too late realized that they have made the biggest mistake in the history of the Fed. Those are Druckenmiller's words, to be clear. 
the biggest mistake in the history of the Fed. They realized it way too late and then started the steepest interest rate hike cycle in US history. The problem is that according to Druckmiller, the historical record shows that when the central bank raises interest rates rather sharply, you very, very rarely get a soft landing. In fact, we've just seen the fastest interest rate hike cycle in modern history. And according to Druckmiller, this was a reactionary policy after the Fed absolutely missed to hit the brakes in early 2022, when the pandemic was effectively over and signs of a recovery were already showing. So I'm sitting here staring in the face at the biggest asset and probably the broadest asset bubble, forget that I've ever seen, that I've ever studied. It went on for 10 or 11 years. And then as the grand finale, um, the government spent $5 trillion on COVID. The Fed financed 60% of it. And as I just described, now we, now we have a big hike in interest rates. Um, it's hard to look at that constellation of factors, know that we've only had a few soft landings since 1950. All of them were, were preceded by what I would call proactive rather than reactive Fed policy and believe we're going to have a soft landing. One never knows, but if you're just looking at the odds, they're very tough. The interviewer then wanted to know what a hard landing could actually look like. And Druckmiller basically answered this question in two ways. First, he explained there will be quote unquote bodies. So much more insolvencies than we've seen in the past. In particular, he's thinking of the banking sector where he expects more banks to fail. If we just look at this graph here by Forbes, we can see that we really haven't seen too many bank failures so far compared to the historical past at least, and especially compared to the 08 financial crisis and the early 2000s. Obviously, all three bank failures that we have witnessed in 2023 made a lot of headlines. Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and more recently First Republic Bank, as well as the acquisition of Red Swiss. But according to Druckmiller, this may only be the start. So let's listen to him again. And then of course you have the, you've already mentioned it, the, the banking problem. We always knew, um, given what I've already described, there were gonna be bodies out there. When you have free money, um, people do stupid things. When you have free money for 11 years, people do really stupid things. So there's stuff under the hood, it's starting to emerge. Obviously the regional banks, recently we had Bed Bath & Beyond, but I would assume there's a lot more bodies coming. The regional banks, the median regional bank has 43% of their um, loans in commercial real estate. About 40% of that is office. As you know, we've had this huge change in lifestyle um, due to COVID. Number one, the great resignation, but number two, people are going to the office. So we have actually a higher vacancy rate than we had in 2008. Obviously, many banks have been struggling due to the duration risk that was caused by the changes in interest rates and the Federal Reserve's aggressive campaign to raise interest rates in an effort to combat inflation. For starters, the rising interest rates have had a negative impact on banks' financial stability because the value of the bank's long-term bonds and other long-term fixed income securities, which are a major asset class for banks, fell in value as interest rates rose. But on top of this, Druckmiller mentioned the exposure of regional banks to commercial real estate loans, which may be the next big problem for smaller and regional banks. To quote JP Morgan Research here, compared to big banks, small banks hold 4.4 times more exposure to US commercial real estate loans than their larger peers. Within that cohort of small banks, commercial real estate loans make up 28.7% of assets compared with only 6.5% at big banks. More worrying, a significant percentage of those loans will require refinancing in the coming years, exacerbating difficulties for borrowers in a rising interest rate environment. As Druckmiller highlighted, the office sector is facing a number of challenges following the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, with remote work becoming the new normal for millions of employees. A considerable number of employees are now favoring the option to continue working from home. And as a result, there has been a notable surge in office vacancy rates, 
throughout the United States in particular. The present overall vacancy rate of 12.5% is similar to what it was in 2010, a year after the commencement of the global financial crisis. And with office values declining, some investors have to inject new capital to appease lenders. Vacancy rates might also leave many borrowers unable to make their payments as they may have difficulties maintaining their current cash flows when lease contracts with companies expire. Now taking all of this into consideration, Truck Miller doesn't want to rule out that something like in 08 may happen again. For we even get into an economic contraction, many of the banks already have impaired balance sheets. If you pile on um, losses in commercial real estate, credit card losses, the stuff that normally happens in recessions, and you take the fact that we have had this big asset bubble going into it, and you take the fact that we just had the most rapid increase in interest rates from the bottom in, in history, I think it's just naive not be open-minded to something really, really bad happening. Again, it is not my forecast, but as a risk manager, it has to be part of my matrix and my equation in thinking about it. Now, in one of the previous clips, Truck Miller also mentioned Bed, Bath and Beyond. So obviously there are more implications of a hard landing and we may not only experience more insolvencies in the banking sector, but in other sectors as well. Truck Miller basically gives us a list of consequences that investors should expect. So let's listen to him again. First of all, when I talk about a hard landing, I'm talking about something, albeit starting from near record margins, that probably encompasses a, say a 20 to 20% plus with an emphasis on the plus decline in corporate profits. Um, unemployment probably going up from the 3.4 rate now to something above five. Um, probably a number of increases in bankruptcies, which as you know, Carol, are astonishingly low given that we've been in one of the most disruptive economic periods since the 1880s and until recently there have been basically no bankruptcies and they're nowhere near where they were in 2008. So to sum up he expects profit margins to decline which obviously leads to declining profits and thus likely falling stock prices. On the other hand unemployment will go up and bankruptcies will increase. What I want to elaborate on a little here is the idea of more bankruptcies. Intuitively, you will think that this sounds really, really bad. But I want to put this a little into perspective here. If we just look at the number of bankruptcies of the last 25 years, we can see that the number has been declining ever since the great financial crisis. And if you take an even longer term view, it becomes clear that we are at a historical record low. And I would argue that this is also a problem due to a phenomenon called the process of creative destruction. It is basically a concept introduced by economist Joseph Schumpeter in the early 20th century and it refers to the continuous cycle of innovation and the displacement of older outdated technologies and systems by newer and more efficient ones. It describes how a new product or service can disrupt the existing market leading to the damage of established companies and industries, but also creating new opportunities for growth and development. And thus, there may be a case to be made that the policymakers should have let more companies go bankrupt during the pandemic. Although to be fair, Goldman Sachs has also shown that there may be fewer so-called zombie companies than expected. So when does Drug Miller predict the hard landing to occur? Well, fairly soon. In fact, as soon as Q4 of this year. So let's listen to him again one final time. In terms of the timing, um, I have le much less certainty on that than I do on whether we're going to have a hard landing or a soft landing. So I put all that together and I look also at the inverted yield curve. The timing has always said sort of third to probably fourth quarter of this year to first quarter of 24. But the recent anecdotes, the banking problems, I wouldn't be surprised if the bean counters a year from now, as they tend to do backward looking, that the thing started sometime in the second quarter. I don't know that, but I do this for a living, so I got to have a forecast. However, at the beginning of the video, Druckmiller also made clear that the current macro environment with all of its 
fast moving parts is incredibly challenging to predict. In fact, he said that likely it is, quote unquote, easily the most challenging period to have a confident forecast in his career. So I think Drug Miller's warning is a reminder that the global economy is a very complex system and that it is always possible for things to go wrong. Investors should be aware of the risks in the current environment and yeah, as a result, take steps to protect their portfolios. But what are those steps? Well, according to Druckenmiller, in the current environment, cash may be particularly valuable as it gives you options to buy assets when they trade at very attractive prices caused by a hard landing. Later in the interview, he recommends asset managers to preserve some capital for the very fat pitches. Let's listen to him one more time. I'm not positive on the stock market, but we've come a long way. I'm afraid of the authorities. Um, and if I like the stock market, uh, um, you know, I would be exposed and, and I'm not exposed. So, so my advice would be to a long short hedge fund, keep your gross low, be open-minded. And if we get a hard landing, um, there are going to be unbelievable opportunities. And I don't want to miss those opportunities by blowing my money now and having some 20 or 30 percent loss where my head is all screwed up when those opportunities present themselves so i'm happy um with with a with a portfolio right now that is not net short or not net long and only about 60 percent gross because funny things happen when you need chaos for for long short guys out there i would say you're going to have unbelievable opportunities in the next couple of years. There's a lot of dispersion um, within industries and just make, just make sure to preserve your capital until they present themselves. Now, what I would point out is that all of this holding some cash sounds very good in theory, but there are actually two schools of thought when it comes to holding cash in your portfolio as cash also yeah, has some significant drawbacks. It can be a major drag on your overall portfolio return in fact, I've done an entire video on this particular subject, so make sure to watch the following video next to learn more about the value and disadvantages of cash in your portfolio. Take care.